part of what I think um, drove the, uh, uh, the choice of this topic for tonight. Well, we actually at the museum, there's so many interesting stories to tell about Birmingham anyway. This is just another angle. And so when you fit a story with a person who's knowledgeable and very excited and passionate about it, you have a really pretty good outcome. And that's what I think we have for you tonight. But of course, I also have to do my shameless plug. <laughs> um, we have been doing these uh, lecture series in groups of three for quite a long time now. Uh, this summer's, this is the last in the current group. And this is the, um, this was a little experimental. This is the museum staff picking topics of interest to them and having a little fun with it. And we've had really good response to that as well. So, but we're going to fall back to our traditional lecture series format for the fall. Oops. I have some flyers over there, so when you go over to get popcorn uh, or something to drink, you can take them up and look at it. But this fall, in September, October, and November, we do one per month. Um, September's is, uh, well, the theme for all three of them is Birmingham's First Families. So in September, we're going to talk about the Allen uh, family and how they were connected to the development of Birmingham as a city from a little rural village into the really a modern city. But their family is very fascinating, so we're going to talk about them. In October, I'm very excited to present the Levinsons, the first Jewish family in Birmingham. And uh, the Levinson uh, family includes modern day political icons, Sandra and Carl Levin. So we have a lot of interesting people in that family to talk about. And then in November, um, we're going to revisit the Peabody family. We did a Peabody presentation about the restaurant um, last spring, and it was just like a reunion. People were remembering it. And so we decided we were going to reconvene, and we were going to um, video record people talking about what they remember about Peabody's restaurant, as well as talking about the family a little bit. So that will be in November, and uh, Doug Koshik, the library director, is going to be um, heading that one up. Just so if you want to get ready and put it into your calendar early, feel free to pick up a flyer over there or talk to me after the presentation. But for now, I'd like to introduce to you the newest member of our museum staff. Uh, this is Kyle Phillips, and I'll let him <laughs> explain a little bit more about how this all came to be and let him get started. All right. Well, right. <laughs> well thank you. Um, well, welcome to my first ever lecture. Um, <laughs> I hope the popcorn turned out uh, pretty well. Um, it was sitting in my sunroom for some time and I was like, oh, I could totally use this. <laughs> Uh, so I went ahead and used way more than I should, but uh, hopefully it's good. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Uh, now one, sh uh, one shameless plug, this is the final shameless plug. Um, there is actually a movie night uh, at Booth Park Yep, on August 23rd. They'll be playing uh, Monsters in Ink, which is pretty much a family movie, but if you don't have kids or your kids aren't around, it's a still pretty good movie. Um, so, I don't know about you, but my favorite thing uh, about summer is just kicking back, hanging out with my friends, and watching good movies. And to me, like, the from the late 90s to maybe the or the late 70s to the early 90s, excuse me, um, really was like a special time for movies. I don't know if it's whether I'm young or naive, but that era of movies, especially the 80s, they just had some kind of charm to it that I can't explain. And uh, during this time period as well, um, Birmingham produced a lot of uh, acting talent uh, by way of uh, actors and people talented in the movie industry. And uh, when I came here to uh, the Birmingham Museum just a few months ago, uh, about in March or uh, April, um, 
we had our Birmingham Bicentennial exhibit up, which we still kind of have up, but uh, we're not going to talk about that. But uh, <laughs> the first couple of people that we had in our rooms were, uh, you know, people like Tim Allen, Bruce Campbell, Sam Raimi, uh, Ted Raimi. Uh, I was just blown away that people I knew that I loved were from Birmingham. They were actually from the same high school. And I really, when I started this journey to figure out what came from Birmingham, I was just blown away at the talent that came here. This is the uh, movie night at Booth Park. Uh, yeah, it starts at 7.30 and they are playing Monsters, Inc. Uh, it actually starts at 8.45, so you have a little leeway to find your spots and everything. Um, but back to the charm of movies. Um, so, I don't know what the last new movie you saw was, but uh, basically Hollywood today is a lot different than Hollywood back then, personally, my opinion. Um, because if you look at movies like, you know, the Avengers movie that just came out, there are so many screenwriters, directors, uh, QA development. There are so many people behind that movie, it's insane. I don't know if you w watched the movie, but the credits just go on for like 15 minutes. It's insane. Um, as opposed to a movie maybe like uh, James Cameron's Terminator, it was one guy, a couple of writers, and a couple of special effects guys, and then just the movie crew. It was very solidified into one person's ideal. And I, I think that incorporates into why it makes those films feel like someone's idea, other than uh, a machine aimed at pleasing the most amount of people possible. Um, and that lasted about until the, the early 90s when uh, computers started uh, making headway of uh, basically making the movie. Um, all right, we go through that. So, so first off, before we begin with the uh, main actors, uh, that came from Birmingham and the talent. Um, coming from a historical background, I feel as if I have a um, duty to tell you of the history of theaters and film in Birmingham. Uh, so, show of hands, how many people have been to the Birmingham Theater on Old Woodward? Basically most of you. Um, but did you know that probably wasn't the first theater in Birmingham. Uh, we have records that uh, the first theater in Birmingham was actually called the Family Theater, and it started around uh, 1913, which is very early uh, compared to other areas in the states. Uh, we have the Eagle Theater in Pontiac about the same time, and uh, of course Detroit had a couple theaters. But uh, Birmingham is a very early adopter in early theater. Now, the family theater didn't do so hot when it uh, first came out. Um, especially during the 1910s, motion pictures were still being adopted and uh, they were kind of a niche audience. People liked them, people didn't like them, people didn't know what they were. Um, but around the 1920s, the owners of the Family Theater, and this is speculation because we don't know what happened to the Family Theater. It was just right next to Poppleton's, and uh, we know that Poppleton's had a fire in uh, about 1916, so we don't really know if the, Pop or the Family Theater burned down with it, but uh, this is just one of the uh, mysteries of history. Um, Where was Poppleton's was, I believe, on Old Woodward. Um, it was right next to the Family Theater. But because the Family Theater was uh, 
on Old Woodward, just as uh, the Birmingham Theater. Um, we think it's fairly safe to assume that the Birmingham Theater was uh, put on top of the uh, family theater, so to speak. Um, but uh, you guys have been to the Birmingham Theater. Um, so you guys have been to the main theater uh, because there's eight separate screens, but there's one that uh, is basically the old screen. It looks a lot different than the uh, Palladium, the, the imagined Palladium. It really kept its charm because um, the architectural firm that built the uh, Birmingham Theater in 1928 was actually built by Rap and Rap, and Rap and Rap is, is not a rap group. Uh, <laughs> uh, they actually built the Chicago Theater in Chicago, obviously, um, the Ambassador Theater in St. Louis, the uh, Paramount Building in Times Square, New York. They were at the time, probably the best known uh, theater architectural firm in the country. So, obviously, um, uh, we wanted to protect the, the look and feel of the theater. Now, it's privately owned, but uh, when the theater was changed into a multiplex in the 80s, um, the city did oversee some things uh, pertaining to keeping the overall look and feel of the theater intact. Um, I should go to the next slide. So, on the left, you see the, the family theater uh, right next to Poppleton's and a garage on the left, your left, um, which was then um, basically constructed into the Birmingham Theater we see today. And uh, this is a shot of it in the 80s and a very cool movie was playing because uh, look at the line out there. You don't see lines like that anymore. Um, you should ask how many people have been to the Birmingham Theater when it was a theater. That's true. So, yes, so the Birmingham Theater was very unique because it played live theater until the 1980s. So I guess I'll re reiterate the question. Uh, how many of you see, have seen live theater there? Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> see, at the time, um, Definitely during the 50s and 60s, movie theaters were being built just solely as movie theaters, no, nothing else. So the fact that the Birmingham Theater played screens, live movies, and live theater were very unique to the city. And uh, honestly, it's how it got its feel um, by doing a hybrid combination of live theater and uh, movies. Um, but that poses another question. Did, they, did the talent that grew up in this area, did, were they influenced by the uh, entertainment options available around the area? Because myself, personally, I live in Clinton Township. And if I were to go to a movie theater, it would be about three miles roughly give or take 15 minutes, and uh, in orange cone season, probably 25 minutes. Um, but what about a, just a walk? A bike ride? That might hit, have an influence. And uh, also present uh, at the same time with the Birmingham Theater, um, I feel, felt like I needed to include the village players. Um, the Village Players, uh, um, I'm just going to read it uh, as they say on the website. The Village Players was founded in 1923 as a non-private theater club, and it was later recognized as a community theater and a 501c3 organization. It is the third oldest community theater in Michigan and ranks among the 50 oldest theater groups in the United States. 
So, as you can see, Birmingham was one of the most theatrical and entertaining places in Michigan, in the 1920s at least. Uh, people that enjoyed themselves here tended to want to stay here. So it's common sense. If you live in an area and it's generally good fun and you enjoy theater and enjoy movies, well, you're not going to go anywhere else. Um, and uh, by the way, the village players are still, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the Booth Park wasn't the last Seamus plug because um, the Moon Over Buffalo is playing uh, in September. I believe it's September 8th they start. Um, it's a comedy, I believe. Um, and if you're interested, uh, just come up to, the, uh, to me after the uh, lecture is over and uh, I can get you in touch with uh, somebody over there or just redirect you to the website. Um, and of course, they're always calling for uh, tryouts for their next um, production. Um, I, not off the top of my head, I don't know what that is right now, but uh, if you're interested in that, they're always calling. All right, well, I just wanted to bring these up because I really wanted to drive the point home that Birmingham has been in the game for a quite a long while, uh, longer than the most places in the area. Uh, of course, besides Detroit and Pontiac, and uh, as I said, residents had easy access to all of these entertainment amenities. And uh, I just think that it had one point, or one part uh, to do with the talent that uh, has generated uh, from the city uh, on the people that grew up here. All right, well, we can't talk about Birmingham at the movies. Uh, without talking about the movers and shakers of the industry uh, that grew up around here. So when I came to the museum the first time, as I said, uh, I was just blown away at the talent that I knew and recognized uh, immediately. And I thought they came from, you know, just Michigan in general, or maybe Detroit, everything, everybody thinks everybody, everybody came from Detroit, but they really came from Birmingham, or they resided in Birmingham. So, first up, um, I guess, can anybody tell me who these are? Uh, I think you got it. Yeah, so uh, on the left is uh, Ted Ramey, and uh, on the right is Sam Ramey. Um, uh, not pictured as Ivan Ramey. Uh, Ramey, Ramey, Mary me. Uh, say that five times fast. Um, but yeah, um, Sam Raimi has uh, directed, uh, you know, such titles as Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Evil Dead 3, Army of Darkness, Dark Man, uh, Spider Man, 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 Man. <laughs> um, but he's mostly known for his uh, just weird directorship. I, I, it's hard to explain, but uh, have you, any of you seen Evil Dead or Evil Dead 2? Okay, we got one person in the back. <laughs> oh, okay, Dark Man. Well, okay, I, I have to give a disclaimer because uh, I'm slightly skewed because I love the Evil Dead series. But I'm also not squeamish. If you are squeamish, I would say stick to, uh, yeah, yeah, stick to Monsters Inc. <laughs> because yeah, it's uh, the the first Evil Dead isn't even rated, um, and then the other uh, the other ones are rated R. Uh, yes, if you love practical 80s special effects, not. Uh, computer graphic CGI. Um, I don't know, that, that just gives me an uncanny valley. I can't describe it. Uh, but anyways, um, the directorship style that he uses, um, he's quoted as saying, uh, the camera should be the main actor in the film, not the main actor himself. 
And you can definitely see that in his films because the camera's just going all over the place. It's like looking at the bookshelves and stuff's flying all over the place. Uh, I love it, I love it. Uh, Ted Raimi, his younger brother, um, uh, probably acted in 95% of Sam Raimi's films. So uh, he's played a cameo in Darkman, All the Evil Deads, uh, uh, Xena, Warrior Princess, where he's the comedic relief right there. Um, he's played roles in all Spider-Man movies, Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3, I should say. Um, and Ivan Raimi, not pictured, uh, actually was a writer for uh, Sam Raimi uh, all up to, um, geez, I think he's still writing for him sometimes. He's also a doctor. Um, oh, just as an aside, these are only the actors that uh, I found. I'm sure there are a lot more. And if you find that I did not cover an actor that you would like me to talk about, I just bring him up. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, they actually grew up in Royal Oak, but they uh, they attended Groves High School. Franklin. Uh, Franklin. Yeah, they grew up in Franklin. <laughs> she was her neighbor. Oh, okay. They grew up in Franklin. We, we were in school. <laughs> okay. Um, but they did attend Groves. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, because you know who who would move here or close to here just oh, for the yeah, school. To Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. As I said, it, um, I have like six, seven actors on here or directors, um, and if I missed one, hey, just be sure to uh, bring it up. And uh, hey, the more you know. Well, there's a sister and there was another sister. Right. All right. Yeah, uh, I think I heard someone say it, but can you guess who this guy with the chin is? There you go. Uh, 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 Bruce Campbell. Um, he's the most famous B-list celebrity. So yeah, it's a toss-up if you know him or not. But uh, yeah, Campbell liked the soup. <laughs> Uh, we actually have uh, some of his, uh, I guess, artifacts that Leslie yes, will show you. Display them while you're talking about Bruce. Yeah. Sam Yeah. So uh, he and uh, Sam Raimi are actually met at Groves High School about 1977, and uh, they became fast friends. And Bruce Campbell uh, obviously starred in the Evil Dead uh, franchise one, two, and three, and the spin-off series Ash vs. Evil Dead. Um, and yeah, they, they just became great friends, and that's how they met. Uh, Campbell also grew up in Royal Oak. Um, and it's, it's bizarre to me because these are two fairly well-known uh, people in Hollywood at the time. And uh, another actor we'll talk about uh, later on, Tim Allen, uh, also went to Groves at Seaholm. Seaholm. I'm sorry. But it was a wrong high school. Yeah. <laughs> the Birmingham School District at the same time. And I don't know what uh, actor-inspired teachers they had, but uh, they must have had someone very uh, passionate about filming. Oh, back. Tim Allen actually lived in Beverly Hills. OK. <laughs> and yes, he grew up. And I was told that he still has a house there. Or he used to live in Cranberry. I used to live in Cranberry. I was in Cranberry. Now I was all working at Cranberry. So how about I just tell you a little bit about the artifacts we have yeah, at the sure. museum. I'm just going to give um, Kyle a break there. And um, uh, regarding Bruce, OK, Bruce Campbell 
is known for his prominent chin. I mean, it's like, like a Jay Leno kind of chin. So um, his B-movie um, following, he's got quite a cult following. And in 2005, he wrote this book called If Chins Could Kill, <laughs> <laughs> Confessions of a B-Movie Actor. And he actually was here in Birmingham uh, for a book signing, and we have one in our collection. It says, to the Birmingham Historical Museum, Stay groovy. <laughs> Bruce. Now, um, the other thing about Bruce, even though you know he's a little grayer now and a little more conservative looking, uh, he has been known to walk the streets of Birmingham when he comes back to visit family and friends wearing a ball cap and being very, you know, under the radar. But he likes to hang around and see his old haunts. Um, about four years ago, we had a large tree. Um, a Dutch elm tree that died at the at the museum, and we had to have it removed. But it was so big, and they couldn't get to it except by having this huge crane system come in and and cut the tree in sections. And as we were, you know, walking off to to go to lunch, we walked past a couple of guys standing on the sidewalk watching this, and one of them was Bruce, and the other one was Sam. <laughs> so, and he did have his cap. But um, just so you know that they that at least Bruce is still connected to the town and comes back from time to time. So this book is available, you know, of course on Amazon and whatnot. But you can't get the one that's signed. You have to come back. <laughs> um, that was followed up by a book called "Make Love: The Bruce Campbell Way," <laughs> which he also signed in 2005 for us. Um, so last but not least, I'm going to just jump ahead a little bit on, um, on Kyle to say that Bruce got very uh, popular and he actually had uh, a central role in um, a television series, I can't remember, three, three years Burn running? Notice. Burn Notice. Notice yeah. was uh, a little Burn later. Notice, but there's Burn Notice too. This was earlier. This was called Briscoe County Junior. And uh, this was the jacket he wore in the show. And it's been donated to our museum, so we also have this in our collection. It says Bruce, and it says Briscoe on there. And so this is what you know he wore on screen as his character all the time. It's a nice, heavy jacket. You know? <coughs> so I just wanted you to know that we have some actual objects from some of these people. OK, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, Yes, uh, well, if you want to see uh, more of Bruce Campbell uh, or want to know what he's all about, he's actually uh, filming right now. Uh, he's doing, he's the host of Ripley's Believe It or Not now on the Travel Channel. On what channel? Uh, the Travel Channel. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, he has his iconic point. Um, all right, on to the next one. Uh, can anybody see who this is? Yes. So. Oh, wow. So, when I began my career of looking for actors in Birmingham, um, I was just blown away when I saw Elaine Stritch. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of somebody in Hollywood having a career of 70 years. Uh, she got her start in uh, theater, actually, on uh, off-Broadway plays in New York. And um, since then, she was an early TV adopter as well. Um, she played, I, I can't even uh, begin to amount of uh, credits she has been in, but uh, some of the uh, ones that I popped out to me um, were later in her life because I'm a little younger. So, uh, Law and Order, Two's Company, and she was actually on 30 Rock and won three Emmys from that, or nominated. Um, it, it, um, and she was also known for her uh, very stern yet funny. Uh, sense of humor, and uh, uh, I actually saw a interview on the top left of where she got that uh, 
picture with Bela Lugosi, which is uh, Dracula. Um, and she was just laughing through it. And uh, that was, yes? What was the name again? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Elaine Stritch. Elaine Stritch? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's actually interesting because she lived uh, over the course of her life in New York, London. Uh, I think she had an apartment in LA. And she decided to retire to Birmingham. Kind of says something. That's because her sister, I think, lived in the Baldwin house and her nieces. In this area. Oh. Elaine Stritch's sister. Alright. Well, uh, if you would like to know more on her uh, career, she actually did a documentary that was uh, shot and produced in Birmingham. Uh, it's called uh, Shoot Me. Uh, <laughs> an Elaine Stritch story. Um, all right. Next. Uh, can anybody tell me who this is? <coughs> uh, very good, yes. Uh, yes. Yep, this is uh, Christine Lati. Um, another name I did not know, but I became very familiar with. Uh, over, over the course of my research. Um, she has been nominated for several Golden Globe Awards, uh, Emmy Awards, and several others. Uh, her notable films are Swing Shift with Kurt Russell. Um, I love Kurt Russell and everything he does. He just did a Netflix special uh, as Santa Claus and he just fits the role very good. Um, uh, Chicago Hope, which is on the top left. Um, Jack and Bobby, uh, Hawaii Five-0, the 2012 reboot, and uh, she was also on uh, Running on Empty. But uh, uh, her notable quirks on screen are being very, uh, very stern and a, a very uh, a strong woman, um, which I definitely appreciated when I, I saw her act. Um, Right. Next one. All right. I don't need to say. All right. So I'm a long, I'm a little younger than you. So uh, most of you uh, know him for other things, but I know him as Buzz Lightyear on Toy Story, the voice of Buzz Lightyear. Um, but. Uh, he was also on TV as Tim the Tool Man Taylor on Home Improvement, where he it made his big debut. Um, I always thought that show was weird because it was a show within a show, uh, because they showed his family life, and then he went on to another show, and he just fixed stuff. I didn't understand. I was too young at the time. Um, but I also have to give him a shout out because through the ups and downs, he w is a lifelong Detroit Lions uh, fan, uh, as seen there. Um, now, I'm a little y too young to understand, but at one point in history, the Lions were actually a team worth rooting for. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wish 2019 is going to change that, but uh, we'll see. Um, he actually got his start at uh, Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. Uh, now in Royal Oak, but it has moved several times uh, throughout the course of his life. Uh, it actually got its start in uh, Bloomfield. Um, he actually started a month after Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle uh, opened, and he was the uh, MC for uh, Mike Binder? Binder? Uh, Binder. Yes, uh, who also grew up in the area. Um, and he's gone on to do. Uh, directorial work, but he got his start in stand-up. Um, but uh, he's been a part of uh, um, Minority Report in 2002, um, uh, Mad About Town, The Contender, Mind of the Married Man, uh, Mad About Town, 
But uh, needless to say, Mike Binder has had a very varied career because he also acted in some of the films he uh, directed. Um, so I don't know how that works. You just create a body double of yourself and act at the same time that you're behind the camera. But uh, I just have to give another shout out to Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. Um, I love comedy. I love to laugh. Um, and I've went to Mark Ridley's several times, but Mark Ridley's has actually jump-started uh, the careers of several people uh, in the Tri-County area. Uh, Dave Coulier, uh, who is Joey on Full House, um, he actually met uh, Bob Saget through Mark Ridley's uh, when Bob Saget was doing a uh, set there. Uh, Paul Feig uh, in Mount Clemens, he uh, wrote uh, several episodes of The Office. Um, he actually directed the 2016 Ghostbusters movie. Um, even Bill Ingvall, uh, the comedian in Texas, he recorded his first and second uh, debut albums, uh, his comedy albums at uh, Mark Ridley's. Um, yeah, so just in general, I find that a lot of people that come from Birmingham or around Birmingham really have a knack for having a sense of humor or just playing out uh, comedy, have a talent for comedy. And I don't know what that is. It's something in the air or something you just learned growing up here, but uh, it's, it's certainly a trait that has been passed down through everybody that has gone to Hollywood and lived there. All right. Um, did any, did I leave out anybody? Probably the most famous is um, Robin Williams, who went yeah. to Detroit Country Day. Yeah. So Robin Williams, uh, he lived in Bloomview uh, Field Hills from 12 to 16. His father was uh, a Ford executive, so he traveled around the country. Uh, uh, Robin Williams actually grew up in Chicago uh, for the early part of his life, uh, moved to Bloomfield Hills for four years, and then uh, went to California. Um, but yes, he did live here uh, for a little bit, and uh, actually David Spade uh, was born in Birmingham, uh, but he moved to Arizona when he was four. Um, There's an actress named Lee Taylor Young. Yes. All right. Uh, Jeff Daniels. <laughs> yeah, I, I tried to include everybody I could, but so, you know, obviously, so many people grew up around here, and uh, the the TV and movie industry. Yeah, there's another lady from Gross Point. She was in um, Rubble Without a Car with James Dean, hmm. and I can't remember. And she was in Rawhide because she really wanted to do a Western, and everybody saw her as a serious actress and as being very much a ladylike and so sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And she said, I really want to do a Western. So the actor had her do Rawhide. And she had a featured role. Wow. Jeez. See, I, I, every day I, I just keep on learning about people that came from the area. Well, the significant factor is the Birmingham Theater, because of the mm -hmm. Nieder, Niederlander family, mm -hmm. had a lot of connections with New York. Mm -hmm. So they would bring a lot of talent here. And because there was that affiliation, mm -hmm. I don't know for how long, they, they did a lot of... Um, promotion for Birmingham and, and, and this area. And because of the, unfortunately, Detroit was one of the second of all mm -hmm. uh, theater groups and also film, vaudeville. Mm -hmm. It was all in Detroit. 
Mm-hmm. But because of the depression, things all started falling apart. That's a good point. Uh, when I was doing my research, uh, there was. Does everybody know what uh, vaudeville is? Yes. Okay. Um, there was a lot of. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm too young. Uh, in it, oh no, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there was actually a lot of vaudeville uh, in the Birmingham theater. Uh, very good point. Uh, that was a very prominent uh, factor in Birmingham. Um, there was actually a couple of actors that came out of. Uh, uh, the tour in Birmingham. All right. Uh, anybody else? Well, when Madonna became famous and she travels, she stayed at the Townsend. <laughs> That's true. I think a lot of people have stayed at the Townsend. <laughs> sure. When you were talking about the theaters, there was a time in downtown Birmingham actually had um, three theaters. Yes. Three theaters. Yes. Um, there was the Studio Four Theater. Um, yes, in the Bloomfield Theater. Um, I don't know what happened to the Studio Four Theater. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, there was a. I think the furniture store was Roche Oh, the uh, okay. Yeah, it's uh, the Studio Four Theater used to be the uh, well, the Studio Four Theater got replaced maybe by the uh, Roche Theater or Roche well, Furniture Store. Was, I don't know. It was an auto dealership. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's just a theater, one story basically. All right. All right. So you got more. Yes, we're going to broaden the scope a little bit. So, um, I know I am a little young, but in 2008, there was something called a financial crisis. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, if I saw gas prices like that, I would just have a heart attack. I drive a gas guzzler, I'm, oh. Um, but uh, a lot of uh, banks were threatened with their jobs. Companies uh, were uh, downsizing. Uh, quite a few, few people were out of a job. Uh, companies were closing uh, their doors. And it was just a really sour, people, or sour time for people overall. It was a bad time. Yeah. Uh, in Michigan, nowhere else could the recession be more immediately felt because of the shift of the automotive industry, um, the change in production, outsourcing, uh, automation of the line, uh, entire factories closed, and with it, a sizable handful of jobs with it. Um, but with those now empty factories came a unique opportunity for Michigan. Out in California, the price of land and rising taxes poised Hollywood to ask themselves, is there any other place that can house what we do for cheaper than here? There were already major studios uh, set to film in Georgia, New Mexico, uh, a little bit of Florida, but they were still looking for a better deal. Uh, states often deploy film incentives to companies to lure them to work on their project uh, at their states to promote job growth in the states and uh, just growth overall. Now, this is where the empty facilities uh, comes into play. Since the auto factories and just basic uh, uh, space that was available in Metro Detroit was so uh, abundant, uh, then Governor Jennifer Gramholm noted this opportunity when she presented a bill which would make the film's uh, the state's film incentives by way of tax uh, credits, uh, some of the most competitive in the country. Jointly with this bill and the available capital 
move and ready, studios naturally flocked to Michigan. Um, so, a few examples of the places that uh, could house film studios. Um, I actually recently learned that uh, the Packard plants in the top right hand corner, uh, that bridge over the uh, West Grand Boulevard, uh, in January of this year, it actually collapsed. Um, it was very sad to see that. Um, but uh, it's just an example of the, the immediate renovation uh, that film studios could do. Because when you're putting on a grandstanding production, uh, you need uh, sound stages, you need backdrops, you need sets. Uh, office space for the studio. Uh, no other state was more ready to accept film studios than Michigan. Um, so, uh, the bill passed in uh, Lansing that gave film studios uh, about a 27% uh, tax credit to uh, film studios. So basically, let's say you're making a, uh, a movie with a budget of $100 million. We, uh, the state taxes you for that. And uh, with tax credits, uh, once the movie is over and uh, production wraps up, uh, you get a portion of that money back. And that's by way of the state of Michigan's tax uh, income. Uh, so naturally, uh, where there's the best deal, you will go to that area. So Michigan had the best deal in the area, so we got a lot of people. So, the next slide. So from 2007 to, well, 2007, 2006, 2005, there was an average of six ma major motion pictures filmed and produced in Michigan. In 2008 alone, 32 major motion pictures were filmed and shot uh, in the state of Michigan alone. Um, that's basically uh, a 500% increase. Um, and that is pretty much attributable to the generous film credits that uh, uh, the governor, Graham Holm, uh, introduced. But uh, you may notice uh, some of the uh, movies on the list, like uh, Gran Torino, uh, that was shot in New York, parts of Birmingham. Um, Whip It, which was that uh, roller skating movie. Um, um, yeah, so within the time frame of Michigan's Little Hollywood, uh, a generous number of big budget movies were made in this area. Grand Torino with uh, Clinton Eastwood, uh, Batman vs. Superman, a cop and book movie, was filmed in downtown Birmingham uh, as a part of the set. Um, Whip It, um, and I said uh, previously, Elaine Stritch's Shoot Me. Um, well, anyways. Um, yes, uh, Transformers uh, was shot in. Um, Ann Arbor and Detroit. Um, Detroit it has a knack for filming fight scenes because um, just big Packard plant sized uh, ruins, so uh, CGI buildings exploding and everything. Um, anyways, uh, this was costing the state a lot of money and uh, in 2011, uh, Governor Rick Snyder took a look, uh, look at that and uh, said in his own words, uh, for every dollar we spent on the film industry, we were only getting around 27 cents back. Um, so previously, you can make a movie with no cap limit. So uh, let's say you made a billion dollar movie. Well, you'd still be text, or you would get, still get that 27% uh, package uh, back. And uh, that costed a lot of money. So first of all, he capped it at $15 million. You couldn't make a movie 
that uh, costed more than $50 million and still receive the film credits. So that limited us a little bit. And uh, slowly but surely, that 27% went to 15% to 9%. And basically in 2015, the film incentives program ended. But that wasn't the end for the film industry uh, in uh, Michigan, in Birmingham and Seoul. So remember at the beginning of the section, where in 2008 the financial crisis reared its ugly head and the American automakers were struggling. By the time Governor Snyder's act to slowly bring the film incentives to rest around 2015, the major automakers in the country generally had rebounded from their losses, uh, Ford less so, um, and they were seeing profits and wanted to expand. This meant they also wanted to market their vehicles more. Um, and this wasn't tied to the big three. Um, Alfa Romeo, Honda, Toyota, they were all experiencing generous profits. Um, they all wanted to advertise through the most communicative means possible. That meant ads on the internet and commercial ads on the TV. Um, now, most of their com commercials go unnoticed. Uh, so, show of hands, how many of you guys have like Netflix, Hulu, like a streaming service? Okay, a few, a few of you. Um, do you get ads in between sometimes when you're watching something and uh, it says like add one or two, like 90 seconds left? Uh, if you're like me, you're probably going to be on your phone or doing something else when that comes up. So you're not really looking at the commercial. You're not looking, you certainly don't care where the commercial is located. But, uh, commercials that yeah. Uh, there, there was an ad, uh, I think it was last year, uh, it was for a Toyota and like a meteor was coming and uh, they were like trying to pack all their stuff in the, uh, the trunk of the car and uh, did you really notice where like they shot that uh, ad? It certainly wasn't in Birmingham because we don't have uh, Rocky Mountains as a backdrop but uh, I, I wouldn't have even cared uh, where that uh, was. The truth is, uh, the big three automakers really use Birmingham to shoot their uh, car commercials. Um, at the beginning of my research, I actually went over to City Hall and uh, uh, looked through the uh, film licenses granted to uh, uh, individual studios, and one after the other, GM, Ford, uh, uh, Fiat Chrysler, GM, Ford, Toyota, Honda, uh, Buick. It's insane how much they uh, film the neighborhoods around here. And uh, yeah, when you're watching a car commercial and you know you, the new Buick is just parked outside a random park, take a good look. There's a good chance that you might see something you maybe recognize. Uh, Birmingham's main customers are car companies and the state of Michigan itself. Uh, they like using their neighborhoods and squeaky clean and waxed uh, uh, streets uh, as a backdrop or uh, really anything in Birmingham. When I first came here, uh, I was just blown away at the, the cleanliness of the community. It's like spotless. And it's no wonder why the big three like to uh, film here because in those car commercials, everything is squeaky clean. Uh, those cars on the driveway on those commercials and somebody steps out of a house, that could very well be a Birmingham house. Um, but uh, as we end today, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for uh, being so t t uh, attentive on my <coughs> first speech. Uh, I hope the popcorn did come out burnt. Um, I really tried, and now I'm gonna have to take on the heruculean task of trying to clean that thing. Uh, <laughs> um, and filming is still going on in Birmingham.
Anyone of you can apply for a film license and jumpstart your directorial career right now. It doesn't cost that much.